welcome back to my huge channel everybody we are not over it yet we haven't been able to get over it the music the atmosphere the looks the design after around 10 years at Maison Magella John Galliano has shown the world what he's actually capable of. Body modifying corsages underpinned by prostheses, anatomical place on the human body. And even though we also saw his Dior Couture era, uh, that was a different game here. The realization of an ecstatic fever dream that frightened us, but also wanted us to get closer to the creatures shown. Caught in the spell of their strength and at the same time having a weird form of compassion for their devotion. But weirdly, we are actually in a time of calm fashion. We no longer have to fight against the stringent 70s with rock and roll. We don't have to fight against the resulting chaos with 90s minimalism. We're actually pretty free right now. We even managed to get over the hyper-reality of the 2000s. We're actually pretty free right now with anything that we want to do. And with all these artificial realities that we built in every century for ourselves, it seems like we're kind of over self-expression and we're, we're in a pretty calm state right now. But that's also not quite true. Because as long as we decide to wear clothes, we are in a momentum of self-expression. And it's always for the same things. It's either to, to reflect our culture, our status, our education or our knowledge. It's usually just a depiction of our inner self or what we want other people to see of ourselves. So whatever piece we actually choose, it's always loaded with a form of expression. We are always saying something with every item of clothing that we're wearing or any piece. Martin Margiela founded his brand in 1988 amidst the jungle of Thierry Mugler, Montana and many other geometric figure and primary color loving designers, mostly emphasizing and even glorifying the female body. All this overstimulation, but presumably also Margiela's natural devotion before that, ultimately led to a collapse of the old familiar system. The opponents can choose whether they want to take part or not. They are confronted with a new form of performance, a unique opportunity that only becomes the result of reproduction later in the process. Magella says in his documentary in his own words that he didn't like the fact that people too easily could understand his collections. People that previously suffered from the complexity of his designs now understood it too easily. And he kind of didn't like that. Because people started to understand exactly what Magella meant and the mainstream even started to dress the way he wanted people to dress or what he was showing on the runway. So it became something like a common trend. And the interesting parallel that we see here to Reka Vakubo that says in a dialogue with Andrew Bolton, the head curator of the Met, uh, that she doesn't like the fact that people might easily understand her collections and thoughts behind it as well. And I don't want to name it as such, but this also sounds like this is a bit giving affectionate gatekeeping here. But no, of course not. The actual issue that both of the designers had with the fact that the collections could be too easily comprehensible is the fact that this would just mean that they cannot mean so much if it's that easy to understand. It reduces their work's value as the work is meant to disrupt and make you think. And that's probably also the reason why they both decided to not really ever talk about the collection they designed. First of all, this means a lot of time spared on not having interviews with the press, having to justify your thoughts that the press is not a huge fan of already and having a lot of spare time to use the time actually more sensefully for designing. So let's come to our actual topic today, which is why there is a certain form of ugliness. And when we think of ugliness, there's also a very certain item that a lot of people think of. My question is here, how come that exactly now everybody wants to be part of the cult? The cult which can ultimately be reduced to an expressive object. And if it's not clear yet, I'm talking about the tabby. The contemporary version of the 15th century Japanese working shoe that is split in two, dividing the toe from the other four. The shoes were worn from upper classes mainly to also lower classes, but then in different colors. So there was a clear structure. They didn't have a sole. It was more something like a sock, actually. After a trip to Japan, Magella finds such an interest in the form of the shoe that seeing them on a construction worker, uh, he starts to make studies about them and he's ending it with the elevated version of the tabby and this time with a heel. And they were disrupted enough to make any cobbler in 1988 probably get a heart attack, 
but also like not striking enough to disrupt a full outfit. Like you wouldn't recognize them too early in the look. It's not like having something neon on. They're pretty quiet for how they look like. After having shown this, for example, in this historical show, and people were not like today. They were the fans out there, but there were also the ones that were like, I don't want my kids to play with you kind of parent people. But it only took a few seasons until this unique shape for your foot was kind of established. And interesting what kind of happened in parallel as well here. There was something going on in Italy uh, in the meantime. By the way, if you haven't subscribed to this beautiful, amazing channel yet, you can do it right now if you want to support me and want me to continue doing these videos. Don't forget to subscribe or follow me on Instagram or be part of the Discord server. We are a trillion people and it's fun and we talk about a lot of niche and very superficial fashion topics. So um, you're missing out if you are not one of our cult. We're continuing now. So there was happening something in parallel kind of in Italy already. There was a persona with a degree in politics, inherited the grandpa's handbag company and who wanted to make a big shift, a big change in the fashion world as well. In a very different way actually, but it's interesting how everything combines also. A person called Mucha Prada was out and about to change the fashion world with a new term she invented by her designs, the ugly chicness. But why are we trying to create something ugly? Like, this doesn't make any sense. This doesn't, it doesn't make any sense at all that we put effort into something and want to create something ugly out of it. We should all thrive for pure perfection, for pure beauty and, and create something that is inevitably as perfect and beautiful and shiny as it's written in the books. So what can that be forcing us to create things that are not being considered beautiful but ugly? Probably the fact that what was being considered beautiful is not beautiful to us. It's pretty subjective actually what is beautiful. It's a deep satisfaction for just, just, just anything. I might not be satisfied with what you think is satisfying, what you think is beautiful. I think we're all aware of that, right? Like Christobal Balenciaga decided to take all sex appeal for the female waist away after Dior clinched it to the extremes or as a Schiaparelli fought back against the classic tweet sets of Chanel in the 30s and fought right back into it with her pure surrealism. So all of these years ago, people were already fighting against this thing we call beauty. They were already in a fight against the established norm of beauty. They created something ugly to show that the art of the beautiful is not the beauty it's commonly defined as. It's like the antithesis of what is supposed to be. And while showing that, they do it even better. In conclusion, this also means that limiting yourself to a certain taste also means limiting your possibilities of creation, always. You are limited to certain tools, to certain techniques, and to a certain aesthetic. The geeky chic that was invented by Prada in the 90s, supported also by the creators of minimalism like Donna Karen, Calvin Klein, Josanda, it was a new form of ugliness that didn't exist like this before. It wasn't minimal at all in its philosophical manner. It was more an intellectual decision to have fine textiles and craftsmanship mixed with an atypical skirt length or, or weird color combinations. And, and color is a great way to start with some weirdness or some fights to, of, of change. Dries van Noten, for example, said in an interview that he forces himself to always start with a color he hates. And he says, nothing is as boring as something beautiful. And if you have a look at Dries van Noten's collections, you might have recognized there are some very atypical color selections, definitely. There, that might be questionable, but then he creates just some beautiful craft around it and it works and it makes it interesting and it makes it clashing. And that's maybe the disruptive thing that makes it appealing to you. Mucha instead decided to go for the beauty of the boring, of feminine simplicity, a typical professional types sometimes that previously received no attention on the catwalk, such as jobs as being a secretary and thus developed them into uber figures in her fashion. Some sort of army of normal intellectual beings that can finally express themselves. And I know this sounds super typical anti-establishment, we're starting a revolution kind of vibe, but that's really how it goes. You take what they give you, you turn it around, you're changing and you feed it back. 
and then they love it. That's the, that's the funny thing about the ugliness. I mean, with avocado greens and sludge browns, uh, patterns that remind you more of the 17s dishcloth than a luxury fashion houses inventive pattern, Mucha had kind of the first debut of the ugly chicness with the Spring 96 collection. And already back the six months after the show, everybody wanted to have her famous ugly and clunky shoes. Meanwhile, Tom Ford is at Gucci designing one show after the other. So does this mean we love the ugly because we see the beauty as irrelevant and superficial? Is that really it? Like, is the only problem that beauty is just superficial? Be probably not. I think the main reason why we don't like the classical form of beauty is because it's naive. It's not realistic. Classical beauty as opposed as, as shown in European, Western media or worldwide media, I would say. Naive for believing in perfectionism that is based on physical benefits. And if we are now getting back to where we started, the tabi bud, it all kind of makes sense that everyone is thriving through authenticity. In a time overflowed with content of perfectionism, we also do have the movement that is fighting against such. We have been exposed to artificial perfectionism in such a brutal way that nothing seems more important to us than banal reality. And the true desire for sincerity. We don't want to see any beauty if it's not real or if it's not the beauty as we want to see it. We want something raw and true and rough. And that's exactly what this shoe stands for because it had to face this very struggle 30 years ago. In a time when fashion trends no longer last six months, when retailers have to have new pieces in their stores every three weeks, we long for the natural beauty that represents us exactly the way we want to be, differentiate us. Whether it's a hat from the Prada 2018 collection or the Tabi boot, you want to reclaim a piece of autonomy and you can only do that if you don't follow those who seem to show you the right way. Not for the sake of differentiation, but the ugly helps you find an ironic way to love fashion and defend it at the same time. We see refugee in brands whose founders are like heroes to us because they make us feel understood. But overall we can say ugliness is just reality. It's the real reality that, that still needs to fight against this depiction of beauty that is not realistic. It's invented, it doesn't exist. And this realistic window of ugliness is even more exciting, more eclectic, more fascinating in colors, shapes and styles. And when talking about the ugly, Prada is the brand that shows the way of subliminal ugly, the atypical beauty that is playing all around with the existing pieces defining a beautiful woman, such as a corsage. Uh, which she just playfully puts over some military coat and some military boots. Uh, it's a bit like the answer to a person who says, you're a woman, I want to see you in a corsage. And Mucha is just saying, oh, you want to see me in a corsage? Um, oh, yeah, no worries. Let me just pull it over my military coat, my high heels that I can stump you with, my coat that is obviously showing my strength and power. Um, I'll just wear it over it. Let's see what you find with that. And this is the parody that makes Micha so amazing and her team. They are playing with the forces, you know, of these powers, these negative powers, forcing females, women, or whoever is supposed to be reflected that way. She takes this power from you. She gives you exactly what you want. You said you want a corsage, but she says, that's the way you get it. It's ugly? Yeah, it's exactly ugly. And that's the forced ugliness. They force us to give them an ugly answer because it's so delusional what they want from us. In contrast to that, there's also a different movement. Like, we need to be aware there are so many forms of ugliness as there are also different forms of beauty. There are also different forms of fighting with ugliness or the perceived uh, society's ugliness against something. There's, for example, the conceptual beauty showcasing way more skin uh, in contrary to Mucha Prada who, where it almost seems like she's holding the skin back. She's not showing it at all because if we think of Tom Ford's Gucci in the 90s um, or like Versa Gianni Versace, Thierry Mugler, uh, even Alaya, it was definitely of exposing the female body in its best form. What is best form? She was literally hiding it not showing it. Oh, you want skin? This is what you get. Oh, it's a woman, the woman you asked for, but she has something that looks almost modest on herself. But as I said, there are also people that are showcasing way more skin 
and the features of the body, Mucha in some sort chose the tool of boredom to excite even more at the end. Michaela Stark chose the contrasting form, which is extreme exaggeration of the female body, morphing her body into a statue-like art piece, sculpting the society perceived imperfections into the main focus points and fighting this way back, while using society's favorite tools, such as, again, the corsage, showing what ugly beauty it can also create. And if we circle back, I love circle back from my corporate email times, I'm sorry. Circling back to the Margiela Artisanal show where we saw a lot of corsages that looked painful, it looked, it hurts the viewer to look at it. It is again, first of all, a very interesting item. When you see it, you know it concludes to pain, but the resolution is that it makes you more beautiful. So we have an item that does not create ugliness. But when we look at the models, something I hear very often about the show is why is everything so ugly? Why do we not see the embroidery, the embellishments, the craftsmanship, the handwork of the people? There's even plastic in it. Like everything looks ugly. It's not like what we're supposed to see. It's not the Elisab that we're expecting from haute couture. But actually it's so odd fashion that it's even on top of the beauty that we're usually seeing in the haute couture shows. And that's something very beautiful because a lot of houses don't dare to go that far with the haute couture collection because it's usually coming back to the origins, to the heritage, such as Demna doing Balenciaga. But when it comes to Margiela, since the house has a very different fundament and probably the strongest fundament when it comes to diversity of beauty, it is actually the perfect answer to, to this. Galliano found a perfect way and we know he can exaggerate in an amazing way. We know his Dior years where everything was under a certain topic and Alexander McQueen also gives me, for example, that feeling of, of very theatrical shows. But he managed to create this time a show where we see models that looked dismorphed, where the body looks like it's, it's not supposed to be, where we see shades in the bodies that might remind us even of corpses, of other things, of everything that we don't classify as beauty, but nevertheless, when we look at it, we, we have an emotion and we cry and a lot of people cried and I have probably watched the show, I don't know, 30, 40 times and Hometown Glory is definitely on repeat on my Spotify. But the reason is why does something that is in common sense perceived as ugly make us cry of happiness, of beauty? So the thing that we call ugly makes us very emotional and makes us cry because it's a window to reality. Ugliness is a form of reality. It's the real world. It's not the beauty. Beauty is just the artificial reflection. It's a dream that we're supposed to reach somehow. And that's also how a lot of brands work. Like they're like, hey, you're always on this path of beauty. You will, one day you will reach it, but keep going. Girl, keep going. One day you will reach the perfect form of beauty. And this is what this show is not about. This is what a lot of brands that chose ugliness or ugly pieces are not about. They choose real pieces that mean something, that are an answer to something else. And that's the beautiful thing about pieces that look disruptive. And that's why I just can't tell people who have a an issue of understanding for things that are obviously not beautiful. And of course, in the Haute Couture show, it's done in the most perfect way. We also have shoes that look very weird in a common sense, very disrupted, and that just don't look like shoes or beautiful, and we question them. This is also, of course, a harder way to deal with it. Of course, there are different aesthetics and ugliness as well. But overall, the lack of sincerity, of authenticity, of too quickly evolving trends, like every second, the amount of core trends of last year, I cannot even tell, probably 50. Uh, we have subcultures. Everything is so defined that we are thriving for something ugly that feels real, that feels like it can hurt us, but it, because it's the reality. And that's the rise of ugly pieces. And that, that's why it even gets kind of commercial because people are fed up with the mainstream form of beauty because it's not reality and we feel it. We start to feel that mainstream beauty is not real beauty. It's not, it's not what provokes emotion or anything in us. And that's also why the tubby boot is so successful right now. The tubby boot is the perfect reflection of why ugliness works. Of course, you can differentiate yourself with it, but also you can show how you see the world with it while wearing it. It's not, it doesn't shape your foot in a beautiful way. Uh, it looks actually almost even normal if you look at, at it from a different perspective. 
but it is such a strong statement to wear it and to stand behind it that it never lost its value and that's and it's even rising right now because everything loses its value everything gets cheap everything is cheap everything is accessible so um, everything that stands for anything is valuable I hope you like this video I really like to talk about this because I'm very often asked why is something ugly successful why do we need something ugly around us I think it's obvious I love the ugliness I'm personally a big fan of Mucha and Martin and also Galliano now, of course. Yeah, I just called him Martin as if he's my friend. Um, no, Magella, of course. So if you like this video, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, which is amazing, obviously, or to any of my other social media accounts, Instagram. I have a one of a kind um, Instagram uh, and the Discord ch server chat is amazing if you want to find like-minded people. We have a lot of fashion topics, very smart people. If you are searching for a certain question, uh, it might not get answered when nobody cares, but if they care, it can get very deep. So they love it. I think it's amazing. And we have meetups, as I said, so I will have the links all down below so you can join the family. We're a little family, which is very beautiful. I love everybody there. And it's actually my dream. Act it's actually a bit like my dream already fulfilled, uh, which is beautiful, as ugly as it is. And to end all of this with my hero's words, Susan Sontag from her manifest notes on camp, it's good because it's awful. <laughs>